Well, I'm so excited today that I get a chance to preach with the preacher, to uh, bring this message with my son. And we've been studying and doing sermon prep, and it's been exciting for us all week long, just preparing to give you this word that we feel is going to be life-changing for all of you. You are what you think. That's the name of the sermon series that we are in. You are not what you drive. You are not where you live. You are not what you make. You are not what you eat. You are what you think. You know, and the very first week we talked about, in fact, the first two weeks, deciding what kind of thought life that you desire can hit a target you don't have. You've got to know what you really want in life. And it's the same way in your thought life. And then today we come to this point of the series. And I, I think it's a powerful one. You have to decide to fight for the thought life you desire. You not only have to decide what kind of thought life you desire, you have to decide to fight for the thought life that you desire. You see, right thinking is a fight. Albert Einstein said, thinking is hard work. That's why so few do it. Joyce Meyer wrote a perennial bestseller entitled Battlefield of the Mind. It's Dionza's favorite book. She says in that book, you cannot have a positive life and at the same time have a negative mind. She goes on to say, Satan will aggressively fight against the renewal of your mind. But it is vital that you press on and continue to pray and study in this area until you gain immeasurable victory. I want you to remember this statement that I'm about to make because it's the basis really of this entire series and study. You might want to write it down. Anybody who desires to change must first accept the fact that as long as they live, their mind will be the most important battlefield of their life. Some of you have been losing on that battlefield for so long that you've almost lost faith that victory is even possible. But listen to the Word of God from 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A clear way of understanding this verse would be to say, we as believers are not confined to normal human limitations. The spiritual weapons God has given us are not carnal or weak or limited because no human created these weapons. They are the weapons of of heaven. And I love so much the text for today. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It's found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and it describes some of these supernatural weapons. Listen to this, verse 10. Finally, let the Lord make you strong. Depend on his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor. Then you can remain strong against the devil's evil plans. Our fight is not against human beings. It's against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of this dark world. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly world. Now, listen to me. I want you to understand the battle against rulers, authorities, and powers in this dark world. It always begins in your mind and begins in your thinking. Verse 13 says, So put on all of God's armor. Evil days will come, but you will be able to stand up to anything. And after you've done everything you can, you will be able to be victorious. Now, here is the first weapon. I love the fact that they're God's weapons. It's God's power. It's his authority and his strength that we have access to. Here's the first weapon, and that's verse 14. So remain strong in the faith. Put the belt of truth around your waist. Now this, of course, refers to the belt the soldiers wore to hold everything together. It's the belt of truth, and it's the key. It's the first weapon because it unlocks everything else that will follow. Two clinical psychologists wrote a book years ago 
called Telling Yourself the Truth. They concluded that every negative, debilitating feeling we have comes from a lie, a lie that we received and a lie that we have believed. And to remove the feeling, we must remove the lie and tell ourselves the truth. You know, when I was younger, um, I was terrified of the dark when I would walk outside in my backyard. I would run from my back porch to my studio, and I want to tell you, I imagined every monster, every critter. I remember those days. I was terrified, <laughs> and I would run. So I, some of my fastest 40 times were from my back porch to the <laughs> studio. I'm telling you, I was flying. But when I was older, the same place, the yeah. same darkness, the same situation, mm -hmm. I wasn't scared. Why? Because I understood the truth about the dark. It posed so no good. threat so in my life, and it unlocks everything else. It unlocks the next weapon, which is in verse 14. Put the armor of godliness on your chest. The King James Version says the breastplate of righteousness. An interesting fact about the breastplate of righteousness is it protects your heart. The Bible says guard your heart for out of it are the issues of life. You know, recently I read one of many scientific studies on the heart and emotional pain. Um, listen to this statement by the scientist. They have reported that pain is always created by the brain, but this might not be entirely true. Now, these are the scientists talking. Pain is not only a sensory experience, they say, but also can be associated with emotional, cognitive, and social components. The heart is considered the source of emotions, desire, and wisdom. So think of this. Wherever thoughts happen, whether they happen in your brain or in your heart, because that's really what these scientists are saying, is that part of the thinking and decision process may be happening in your heart, not just in your brain, as we thought all along. But God was so far ahead of it. Being the creator, he in advance gave us weapons that protect our mind and our heart. It's all good. I love that so much. In verse 15, it gives us the next weapon. It says, wear on your feet what will prepare you to tell the good news of peace. Wow, wow, wow. I love that so much because that means that you're carrying peace, you're bringing peace, so you must have the peace that passes understanding. That is God's peace. Let's move on to verse 16. Also pick up the shield of faith. With it, you can put out all the flaming arrows or tormenting thoughts of the evil one. Now, this is the heart of the message today. This is our word. All attacks on your thinking, all strongholds in your mind, they're no match for what God has put in you. What God has put in you is so powerful. It's like a superpower. My little three-year-old, Doc, he loves superheroes more <laughs> he than anything. I'm telling you, he lives for all of them. But one of his favorite superheroes is Captain America. And he says, Konamika. He calls him Konamika, Konamika Shield. And he, he just goes around fighting. Can I tell you today that the shield of faith is so much stronger than Konamika's shield or anything else that you could conjure up yourself, anything that you could ever do on your own. This is God's power to fight off anything the enemy would ever throw your way. You know, the next weapon is in verse 17. Put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Holy Spirit. The sword is God's holy word. At all times, pray by the power of the Spirit. Your mind is prepared for warfare. Your head is covered with the helmet of salvation. In other words, you have redeemed victorious thoughts yes. with Almighty God. Your thought life is reconciled to God 
Through the cross, you have a two-edged sword. What is that? The word of God that cuts through every defense of the devil in your mind. Yes. These weapons are mighty, and they're supernaturally effective in destroying the strongest and most established bondages in our mind. That's really good news for us. Now let's go back to 2 Corinthians 10, where we first began reading this morning. I love the warfare language here in verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Anyone who has a knowledge of God absolutely knows the torment, the defeat, the sorrow, the worry, the regret, the guilt, the shame, the fear, the dread that is dominating our thoughts is trying to replace and displace our God thoughts. That's the object. The devil wants to push the God thoughts out. We're going to be talking about that a lot more next week. And we know when we are having God thoughts, don't we? And we know when our thoughts oppose and contradict God. Now, let's look at some God thoughts just briefly in Jeremiah 29 and 11. God says this through his prophet. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now, here's a word for all of us during this coronavirus season. Every thought of poverty and lack and danger and hopelessness and fear of the future is actually opposing the knowledge of God. That's not God's will for you. And we must cast those thoughts down. We have to deal ruthlessly with them or they will stay. They will not leave on their own. We must cast them down. We must cast them out. If your new normal, you know, we're hearing the new normal, the new normal everywhere. Well, it's going to be a new normal. If your new normal is a life of fear, then you're opposing the thoughts and the will of God for your life. The last line of the text today is the most powerful and practical key to this warfare. It says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. According to a dear friend of mine in this church, who's a psychiatrist and counselor, we have four minds, not one. We have the conscious mind, the critical mind, the subconscious mind, and the unconscious mind. The fact that stuck in my mind was that in our conscious mind, he says we're only able to hold about six pieces of information at one time. And he went on to say, if you introduce another piece of data or thought, one of those other thoughts has to hit the door, has to leave. In other words, you and I have the power to decide every thought we think. Isn't that amazing? And the scripture, it actually says we not only have the power to decide what thoughts must go and what thoughts must stay, but we have the power to make our thoughts obey Christ, to obey Almighty God. Come on, let's read it one more time. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, in the Message Bible, Denny, it reads like this. Fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Now let's talk today about some common examples of, of loose thoughts, those out of control rogue thoughts that we often allow into our mind that become so toxic. Here's the first area. And you know, most psychologists and counselors are gonna recognize these areas. First is catastrophizing. Now, that means when you think of the worst thing that can happen, and then you believe that's exactly what's going to happen. 
It's when you blow things out of proportion, turning little problems and setbacks into catastrophes. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, no temptation, and the word in the Greek here also means trial, no temptation, no trial has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you can bear. You know, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You know, every one of us need to come to this conclusion. Whatever we're experiencing, somebody has overcome it. Whatever's happening to us, somebody has been through it before. It's not new. It's not special. It's something that is common to all of us. And it's the same way during this season that we are in. Don't turn this into a catastrophe. Don't make this worse than it is. You say, well, it's already pretty bad. And I agree, but I can tell you that your thinking can make it worse. Throw that off. Cast that down. And receive the fact that with every trial, the Lord God creates an exit sign for your escape. Wow. Another loose thought is all or nothing. And this is when you think in absolutes. It's either all good or it's completely awful. It's a success or a complete failure. You're all in and you're just, you're going for it. Or something happens and you're out. You don't want to be a part at all. It's black or white. There's no gray in between. And here's the thing with that kind of thinking is you discount all the great things that God has given you. You discount all the blessings, all the breakthroughs. One bad thing creeps up and boom, you throw it all to the side. It's all or nothing. This is what the Bible says about that. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purposes. I love that so much because no matter if you think that it's good or if you think that it's bad, God's going to use it for your good according to his purposes if you serve and you love Jesus. I love that. Wow, that's powerful, Denny. I call this next area of thinking shoulda, woulda, coulda thinking. That's when you get angry or upset because things don't turn out the way you think they should have turned out. And you have rigid expectations about what you and others should have done, could have done, would have done. Boy, that's a bad place to live because you never, ever are able to rest at a place of contentment and joy. James 1 and 2 says this, my brethren, and I love the way that he is speaking to Christians because, you know, sometimes we set so high standards for ourselves because we're believers. And the fact is, just because we're believers doesn't mean that we don't fight with the same things that everybody else fights with. It just means we have spiritual weapons that are very effective to cast these thoughts down. James 1 and 2 says, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into unusual temptations. Knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, the fact is, the things that you think should have happened actually happened exactly as they were supposed to happen to get you to the ultimate place that God desires for you to be. Those things that you say, man, mm, I wish that would have. No. If you went back and tried to be the architect of your life, you would never have arrived at this point with the kind of knowledge and wisdom that you have. Wow, that's so good and so true. The next one is filtering. Filtering is when you automatically filter out positive information and you focus on the negative, self-defeating information. You know, there's a story of a monk who lived in a monastery and he was only allowed to have two words every single year. Well, it was time for him to speak his two words to the bishop and he said, bed hard. 
The next year passed, and it was time for his two words again, and he said, food bad. You make me laugh. Why are you laughing? <laughs> and then the third year, he stood before the bishop to speak his two words, and he said, I quit. And the bishop said, good. I forgot the punchline. I was just, just kidding. Because <laughs> all you've done since you've gotten here is complain. Let me tell you. <laughs> You're laughing so hard. So good. <laughs> Everything in life is not bad. God has given us so many breakthroughs and so many great things, but when we focus and we filter on the one thing that's gone bad, we discount everything God has done for us. This is what it says in the Bible, Thessalonians, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Can I tell you today that just being grateful, just coming with an attitude of thanksgiving, it gives you the posture of a healthy lifestyle of thinking it gives you the mind of christ amen so good the next one is actually jumping to conclusions this is my own struggle i, I can tell you i'm i'm a guy who just sometimes jumps right to the wrong conclusions see when you make assumptions and jump to negative conclusions about what other people think about you without any real evidence, it's going to result in toxic thinking. Uh, you got to cast those thoughts down. You, you have to believe the best. People, if they are talking about you, uh, they're saying good things. And I love Joel Osteen. He, he is one of my favorite humans on the planet. I have the privilege of calling him friend. And every time we meet at Joel Osteen's in Houston at the great Lakewood Church, there'll be a new pastor or a new couple that has come into his fellowship, and they'll raise their hand, and we get this question every time. Joel, how do you deal with all the criticism you receive? And his answer is always the same. In fact, I can quote it. He says, well, you know, I just like to think everybody likes me and is for me, and I don't ever read any of that stuff. And if anybody on my staff ever brings it to me, they understand that they're not ever to let me know what people are saying that is evil or bad. He said, I, I just think people just like me and are for me. And I thought, man, that's the deal. And then he said, I just run in my lane, and I let everybody else run in their lane. You know, I was speaking to the Evangel Honors Assembly one day. And I didn't feel particularly good about the message that day. So I was really struggling. Sometimes speakers struggle. You, you just stand before people and you're just struggling to get across your point. And that was what was happening as I stood that day before the student body. And I wasn't in the best frame of mind. Jan Reedy, who is in this church, was on the staff of this church for many years, along with her wonderful husband, Denny, was sitting with some other teachers on the second row. And Jan is an all-star teacher at, um, at Evangel and just brilliant gal. And somebody I just, I really love her. And I noticed that during my message, she was texting. She's texting during my message. And I thought, really? Here, I'm up here dying. And she's texting during my message is she that rude to just disrespect me in this way? And by the time the meeting was over, you know, I knew I had to speak to her about this personal affront. And of course, I'd already judged her and jumped to conclusions. And I'll never forget her standing there listening to my accusation with total shock and hurt. You know what she'd been doing? She wasn't texting. She had posted on her Instagram a picture of me speaking. And then she had said the single kindest thing anyone could have ever said about a communicator about me. I was so embarrassed and ashamed. But that's what the propensity to jump to conclusions results in.
And that's why we must cast down evil and futile imaginations. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 7, Love never gives up on people, never stops trusting, never loses hope, and never quits. The next one is labeling. Labeling is when you label yourself based on some shortcoming, a mistake or failure in your life. So it sounds like I failed a test, so therefore I'm a failure in life. I said something stupid, so I must be stupid. And if you begin the process and the thought life of labeling yourself, it's not long before you begin judging and labeling others based on one thing or one situation that occurred in their life. You know, nobody can label us or judge us but Almighty God. What does God say you are? What does God say that we are in Him? In uh, 1 Peter 2.9, He says, But you are a chosen people. You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If any way, shape, and form you call yourself or label yourself other than that, it's a lie from the enemy. That is how God views you. And Jesus, he takes this seriously. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew. He says, if you call someone a fool, you will be taken to court. If you judge someone, you will be judged. And if you say that someone is worthless, you will be in danger of the fires of hell. Today, I want to tell you, don't listen to the words of those around you. Listen to the word of God. And he said, you're an incredible son, a credible daughter with a mighty, mighty future. Amen. Another area of of toxic thought, these loose thoughts, these rogue thoughts that fill our minds and and, and cause such havoc is downplaying the positive. When good things happen and you dismiss them as no big deal or just plain nonsense. For example, you dismiss a compliment as being insincere. Oh, I don't believe that. Oh, you say that to everyone. Or you even you win an award for something, but you tell yourself it was no great achievement. You know, I did that, but I didn't do what they did. I haven't done the ultimate. I, I, you know, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? That's what the Word says. Don't you see how wonderful, kind, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. That's Romans 2 and 4. It's like God is saying, do do you not see how kind and patient I am with you, how much I am for you, that I even send kindness to you to bring you into line with my will? And What? You're going to reject that? Act as if it didn't happen? I've given you gifts. I've given you talents. I've given you opportunities. I've given you successes. I've given you a lot of wins in life. Do you know that I did that for you? I did that so that you could come into line with my will and my purpose and my destiny for you. Let me tell you, extreme gratitude and honest humility are the weapons that destroy this stronghold in our lives. Sometimes the stronghold of toxic thoughts has become so much the norm that it's our happy place. You know that self-pity can become as addictive as cocaine. Those who downplay the positive and succumb to self-pity become agile thinkers. They nimbly step around the many great moments, advantages, and opportunities that they've been given, and at the same time, they doggedly hold on to their negative view of life. All I can tell you is that we need to rejoice every time anything good and wonderful happens to us. Any accomplishment, go ahead. Enjoy it. Somebody tells you you did a great job and compliments you. Somebody said this. They said, let it go in one ear and enjoy it all the way 
till it goes out the other ear. I don't believe that. This is the way I want to enjoy a compliment. I want it to go in one ear, and then I want to do this. I want to hold it in there for a while until I can just be renewed and understand God is a good God. He let me do a good thing, and his will and purpose is that I feel really good about it. Amen. That's so good. Another loose thought that's negative is personalizing. This is when you take responsibility for events that are out of your control, things that are impossible for you to control. And you're quick to assume that other people's behavior is some kind of response directly towards you. For example, if you're in a restaurant and you're there and you look across the room and someone's laughing without having any context, you automatically assume they're laughing at you, making everything about you. This is what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes. Do not take to heart all the things that people say. Trust what God says over the words of others. Proverbs says it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but keep the love of Christ in your life. Let me tell you today, don't respond to everything that everyone says. Keep the honor in your life by trusting the words of God over the words of others. Amen. Praise God. And then we have overgeneralizing. Now, this sounds benign. It sounds harmless, overgeneralizing. I mean, how could that be harmful and toxic in your thought life? Well, when you make generalizations based on a few rare events, you can come into a very desperate and dangerous place before you know it. For example, if the newspaper reports bad news, you think there's nothing out there but bad news. And that's just not true. When you're overgeneralizing, it just takes a few negative events to convince you that a negative pattern exists and it's going to persist. For example, if you're struggling to find a job, you think, I'm never going to find a job. And the fact is, <laughs> you've only done three or four job interviews. You overgeneralize and it locks you in to a thought pattern that separates you from the best of life and also separates you from relationships that you desperately need. You know, the extreme of overgeneralizing, for instance, is racism. How did Adolf Hitler ever justify singling out and killing six million Jews because of their race? And how did he get millions of people to agree with him? They overgeneralized to the extreme. How did Americans justify enslaving Africans because of their color? How did Australians justify the mass slaughter and sterilization of the Aboriginal people? How do those in India still have a caste system based on color? How does elitism based on family name and the address where you live still exist in many prominent cities all over the world. It's called overgeneralizing. It's when we come to a place where we really think that we can put people in categories because of a few experiences or a few toxic thoughts that maybe we have received from others or even shared with friends and family. Such a shame. We've got to cast that down. The Word of God says this. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it keep your mouth free of perversity keep corrupt talk far from your lips let your eyes look straight ahead fix your gaze directly before you give careful thought 
to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all of your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. That's Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. And really what it's saying is this. You don't need to get sidetracked. You don't need to get extreme to the left and extreme to the right, feeling that you know everything because you have a few facts or instances to piece together in some kind of incriminating chain. No, God wants us to understand. Through the cross, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have all the power and authority we need to win the war of the mind. Okay? But how do you actually do that? d Rod, you want to tell us? You know, number one, you start with your awareness. It's coming to grips with the fact that your thought life is not what it should be. You can't correct a problem that you think you don't have. You got to become aware. You got to see it and be intentional about it. Number one. Number two is with your confession. Can I tell you today, your words are so powerful. What you say, it just makes your life and direction through Christ Jesus. So with your words, confess that he is almighty God. Number three is with your authority. I want to tell you today, we must never feel that the battle will have any other outcome but victory with almighty God. We have authority in the name of Jesus. You know, going through all these loose thoughts today, thoughts of the enemy where the enemy has control over us. I can relate with every single one of them oh, me too. because I deal with this. All of us do. It's a, it's a battlefield. Yeah. And I love the very beginning. I just love our text so much because it says through God's strength, through God's power, yeah. through putting on God's armor, through the power of the cross and the Holy Spirit, we have access to be able to fight and we win every single time regardless of the situation we have control over our mind what is that i pray one thing for you i pray one thing for your family for your children for your spouse that you can have the mind yes. of christ if you have the mind of christ guess what that is that is winning yes amen you know you were talking about this authority and you, you just you did it so powerfully did it but I, it reminds me of a story of Smith Wigglesworth, who was a great healer and man of God, and a man who understood spiritual warfare. And someone asked him one time, said, how do you define authority? And he said, well, he said, I was getting on the train one day. And he said there was um, a lady that was also getting on the train at the same time, and her dog had followed her from her home nearby. And she turned and said, now, Go on, go on, Fido. Go ahead and leave. Go, go ahead, go back home. Go back home. And said the dog just stayed there. And just before she got on that train, she turned and she said, Go back home. And the dog turned and ran with its tail between its legs back home. And he said, That's authority. And the fact is, you can just put up with your thought life or you can take authority over it. But it takes you understanding that when you say to that thought, no, you, you have no access. I cast you down in the name of Jesus. I'm not thinking of that. You know, I can actually remember times. In fact, I was on an elevator one time. And as I'm on this elevator with other people on it, there was a thought that came to my mind. And it was so offensive to me that I, I knew to rebuke it. And I did it right out loud. I scared everybody in the elevator. I said, no! Not, <laughs> they all looked at me. They thought something was wrong with me. But the fact is something was right with me because I was getting the wrong stuff out. All I can say, don't do that. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. What d -Rod just shared is the key. And I want us to pray right now. I want to pray for you. All right, do you want to change life? Do you, do you want Jesus to change your thinking? then I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Everybody pray this prayer. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, this is the time. And I'm going to ask that you 
send us word on the responses. Uh, they call that the chat, right, on the bottom of the chat. Yes. And I'm going to ask that you just put, today I got right with God. Just let us know if you pray this prayer and you, you're getting right with God. And then those of you that have been struggling with your thought life, you've been so defeated by these rogue thoughts that you've had to cast down. We're going to believe that this is going to be a new beginning of authority and awareness for you. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all of those that are listening. Now, just pray this prayer after me. Father God, Father God I, ask I ask in Jesus' name that you will change my life and change my thoughts. I want this to be a day that I can look back on and say, from that day on, I was never the same. Forgive me for my sins. Make my life brand new. And let me walk with you with a mind that thinks your thoughts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. And please remember this. The best is yet to come. And part of the best is next week, Denny. Come on. Because we're going to be back here in the sanctuary. That's right. On Pentecost Sunday. Yes. God bless you. We love you.